I don't think there's a more iconic figure in Greek mythology than Medusa, and in most cases it's not because of her story or her character, but because of her appearance. If you ask someone who knows next to nothing about mythology who Medusa is, it's likely they'll tell you it's that snake-haired woman who can turn people into stone. The most viewed video on this channel is the story of Medusa as told by the Roman poet Ovid. Looking back now, it's not a video I'm particularly pleased with, because it doesn't really tell the whole story, and it also gives the wrong impression to those not willing to look any deeper. So today I'll combine everything I've discussed in the past regarding Medusa, hopefully into one coherent video, as we take a look at the many faces behind Greek mythology's most iconic monster. Before we begin, you need to forget everything you think you know. Medusa was not a woman transformed into a gorgon, at least not to begin with. What's important to note is that the gorgon has appeared all throughout Greek mythology, potentially stretching as far back as 6000 BC, so their appearance and meaning has gone through several changes. The first mention of snake-haired women comes from the Erinyes, or the Furies, these three were in charge of punishing men who had committed unspeakable crimes on Earth. They were depicted as ugly winged women who had poisonous serpents entwined around their arms, their waist, and more importantly, their hair. The Urinyes may not have been considered a gorgon, but they were very similar in terms of appearance to the very first gorgon. The very first gorgon is referred to as the Elder Gorgon, who by some was considered Medusa's father, whilst others equated this image to another figure known as Gorgo, the daughter of the titan Helios. Just by looking at Gorgo, it is pretty hard to tell if it's a male or a female. These early depictions aren't seductive women with snake hair. They had beards, tusks, and curly hair, which may have been where the transition into snakes started from. Gorgo would eventually be killed by Zeus during the Titanomachy. At this point in time, the Gorgons had no real purpose, and Medusa certainly wasn't mentioned by name. These bearded women continued appearing until they were established as the protectors of oracles. Their appearance slightly changed, however. They now had scales for skin, sharp claws, wings, and locks of hair entwined with snakes a mix between the Arrhenes and a Harpy. We then begin to hear about the Gorgons in literature around the 8th century BC, with Homer's Iliad. Here Homer refers to the Aegis, which was a shield commonly associated with Zeus and Athena, encrusted with the head of a Gorgon. The protective figure of the oracles now also featured in myths around Zeus and Athena. It's also not that strange for many cultures to ward off evil with something even more terrifying. Before Homer's Iliad, all we had recorded about gorgons came from pottery and sculptures, so the 8th century BC onwards marks when the gorgons began to develop as characters and in terms of story. In Homer's next piece, The Odyssey, the gorgon is mentioned once again, but this time as an awful monster. By the way it's written, it appears Homer believed there was only one Gorgon. The 7th century BC is where the story starts to become more familiar. In his Theogony, Hesiod states that there are three Gorgons, the daughters of the primordial sea deities, Ceto and Phorces. This is also one of the first times they're mentioned by name. Steno the Mighty, Euryale of the Wide Sea, and Medusa, the Queen. Of these three sisters, Medusa is the only one described as mortal, 
but it's unclear if she was mortal as in she looked different from her sisters, or mortal as in she would age. Sculptures and vases of this time would suggest all three were seen having a monstrous form. In 490 BC, the poet Pindarus referred to Medusa as fair-cheeked Medusa. Several hundred years on from Homer and Hesiod's work, Medusa, unlike her sisters, began to be shown as beautiful as well as terrifying. As more poets mention Medusa and the Gorgons, they were established as not only having serpents for hair, but also a stare that could turn anyone into stone. Now I'm sure what most people have been waiting for is the story that involves Medusa, Poseidon and Athena, because that's the most dramatised version. Hesiod does briefly mention some kind of seduction between Poseidon and Medusa when he says they laid together in a field of spring flowers, but most of the time this is pretty much just ignored. When Ovid published his Metamorphoses in the 8th century AD, he spoke about over 200 different myths and stories, one of the most popular of course being the story of Medusa. There are three things that are important to note about Ovid. One, many of his stories are much more dramatised than the poets and historians who came before him. Two, he wasn't the god's biggest fan, and so whenever he had the chance to paint them in a negative light he took it. And three, he was Roman. This is important because the Romans did view some gods in a different light to the Greeks, Athena and Ares being good examples. Unlike those who came before him, Ovid was one of the first to describe Medusa as completely human, a young maiden without the physical traits of her sisters. In this interpretation, Poseidon attempts to seduce Medusa, and when she rejects his advances she flees into one of Athena's temples. He follows her inside and then has his way with her anyway, which is probably the best way I can describe it without being demonetized. Athena seeing these events unfold was angered that her temple had been defiled in this manner. She then punished Medusa by transforming her into a snake-haired monster. Any man who looked at her from that day on would be turned into stone. And if that wasn't enough, she was then sent into exile. The next time she appears is in the story of Perseus, who needed to retrieve her head in order to defeat the sea monster Cetus. With help from the gods, Perseus decapitates Medusa, and from her neck sprung her two children, the winged steed Pegasus and the golden giant Chrysor. Athena's curse prevented her from having these children, and the father was of course Poseidon. The main issue of Ovid's version is it's the only one that claims of this interaction between Medusa and Poseidon. It also paints Athena in a light that we never see from any other Greek poet. Poseidon, or Neptune's actions, are not out of the norm for him, but here there are mentions of Athena being jealous of Medusa's beauty, as well as being petty and fairly irrational which is something we see again in Ovid's story involving Athena and Arachne. It's pretty clear Ovid doesn't like Athena, or in this case Minerva, which does make sense considering the Romans valued Mars or Ares over Minerva and Athena. Everything prior to Ovid's story points towards Athena being one of, if not the most, level-headed, rational and respected deities in the Greek pantheon, which honestly at times isn't very difficult, but she still was. I guess you could say as somewhat of a retaliation to Ovid's story, the Greeks adapted the ending. Athena instead transforms Medusa into a Gorgon as a way of protecting herself. She couldn't continuously watch over her, so as a Gorgon, no man could ever harm her again. There are some stories from Greek sources where Athena did punish Medusa. In one of these, Medusa compared her beauty to the gods, and we all know how hubris goes. In this case, the transformation was to teach her a lesson. If you're going to disrespect others based on your own beauty, especially the gods, they can easily take it away. You also have variations of this story where Medusa slept with Poseidon in Athena's temple for her own personal gain, so again the punishment here makes more sense. It's no coincidence that the original Medusa video blew up shortly after high profile cases of sexual assault were thrust into the mainstream media. I honestly don't know if people genuinely believed Medusa's case was more than a fictional story, or whether the idea of a woman being sexually assaulted and then blamed is something that resonated with those who had been through a similar experience. Either way, I'm not here to tell you that you're wrong if Ovid's version is the story that you most relate to, but if the only thing you take away is that Medusa was a victim treated unfairly, then you miss out on so much. 
If you go by Ovid's version, then even in her own story, Medusa has no importance. There's nothing really positive to take away from this story, and that does belittle what she and the Gorgon have symbolised throughout history. The Gorgon-born Medusa we mentioned earlier was a symbol of protection. Her face appeared on amulets known as the Gorgonian, which kept away evil spirits. In later years, her face was even painted on the front of women's shelters, to let them know these were places where they could feel safe. Even in death, her head was used by Perseus to defeat Cetus and save Andromeda. After Medusa's death, Athena took her head and placed it on the Aegis, the ultimate sign of protection and power. The reason I wanted to title this video The Many Faces of Medusa is not only because her change in appearance literally means she has many different faces, but because there are many different sides to her. She isn't just a victim, she's a monster, a villain, a maiden, a mother, a symbol of protection and a source of hope all rolled into one. There aren't many characters in Greek mythology that can be interpreted in so many different ways and elicit so many different emotions, and none of them are wrong. It just comes down to which one you prefer and what you choose to take from it. If you have enjoyed the opening artwork and animation for this video, they were created by the very talented Mando Teresa. If you would like to see the process behind creating these Gorgon paintings, I'll leave a link to her video and YouTube channel along with her other socials, so you guys can head over there and show her the appreciation she deserves. As always, I've been your host, Mythology and Fiction Explained.